All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. My good friend, Tommy Gambardella. You know, in New York, it's Tommy Gambardella. Tommy uh, recently made headlines. Uh, Tommy retired in the way that 99.9% of the cops say they're going to retire, but they don't have the balls to do it. Tommy did it. Tommy's a gentleman, served 20 years in this department. He's a, he was a hardworking cop. I worked for him for a while when he was a young sergeant. I was a rookie cop. Um, I could attest to his work ethic. I could attest to his love for the job, for the city of New York, for the community that he serves, for his coworkers as well. Um, Tommy taught me a lot of things and me and a lot of other young cops. Um, and I modeled my career around some of the stuff he taught me. And uh, I saw him getting demonized in the news. I reached out to him and I know Tommy's not a shy guy. And I know, you know, I, I people would love to hear his story, hear who he is. Um, you know, he was a great sergeant. He done a lot of great work and I'd just love to hear his career. And, and I'm sure you guys are going to love it too. Tommy, thank you for joining us, my brother. Thank you for having me, John. Thank you very much. Really. And it's a real pleasure to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. And, um, I'm really glad that this podcast is a success for you. I'm enjoying it a lot. I'm really glad you're having me on here tonight. No, no, no. It's great. It's, it's doing good. All, all I'm trying to do is, you know, I've been lucky enough to be on the news, to be on a bunch of different platforms, discuss my career. You know, I really do feel police work is a calling. It's a, it's a blessing. You know, it was always good for me. You know, I was a dumb young kid. It gave me an opportunity to, to actually become a staple in the community. And I just, I, I want to give that to other guys too. Like, I, I think that we're all very interesting people. I, I think the cops that I meet and the firemen and the teachers and the sanitation workers, I think they're much more interesting people than these celebrities that we run into on the streets in New York. I don't, you know, most of them are phony. Like we're real people. We're the ones, we're the backbones of the city. And I think that people we're should We're the know. real thing. We're, I, we are the real deal. We're the people, we're the real make, deal. We're the people they make movies about, you know? So, yes. so, so Tommy, so uh, just tell us how you grew up a little bit. Where, where'd you come from? Like, I grew up my whole life in Brooklyn for 26 years. I grew up in the Windsor Terrace area of Brooklyn on East Second Street between Greenwood Avenue, Fort Hamilton Parkway. I was a neighborhood kid, middle-class family. My dad was a cop. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. I have one sibling, a sister. She's older than me. And, um, you know, I, I, I did the best I could growing up. I went to school. I was an athlete. I always had a summer job. And um, I obtained my street smarts and my wit through the years just from how I grew up. Yeah, absolutely. So you're a Brooklyn kid growing up on the streets in New York. How was New York when you were growing up? Like what years were you coming up in your teenage years, hanging out and stuff? The 90s. I would say the 90s. Now, my neck of the woods wasn't that bad. It was pretty much a nicer area of Brooklyn. We did get out a little bit. Me and friends of mine that I associated with, we did go to places like Bay Ridge and Marine Park, but we knew where not to go. Crime, as I found out later on, was through the roof, very dangerous. Drugs were an epidemic back then. The crack, the heroin. Um, it was just, you know, most of the city was pretty a high rate of uh, crime, especially Manhattan. I remember uh, taking the train when I was maybe like 92, 93. We would take the train to the city to see it. This is before Disney fixed up 42nd Street. Just something for us to see. The pimps, the prostitutes, you know, the, the vagrants. All, all of that was like entertainment for us. But uh, growing up in the neighborhood, it wasn't bad. It wasn't, you know... It wasn't exactly the suburbs. We grew up in apartments. You know, nobody had money. We didn't have backyards, but we did the best we could. And, um, you know, you get to a certain point in life where there's two directions you're going to go. You're going to go straight or you're going to go crooked. Me and most of the people I hung out with, we went straight. Like I said, I ended up, I was 21 years old when I got the job. Like I said, I always worked. But when I took this job, I was 21. At the time, I was working at NYU doing security there. And I was also working for this company, Reliant Electrical, as an electrician, non-union electrician. And my dad, who was a cop, he retired in 1988, told me, if you're going to stay home, you're going to have to take these city exams. You're going to have to take, because this is the way to go. He knew how great it was, how great the pension system, the benefits back then, the camaraderie of the job. From what he knew, he convinced me to take all the tests. And I ended up taking the police department I got sworn in July 1st, 2002. I got notified on a Friday. I got sworn in on a Monday. Was it, uh, was it something you always wanted to do? Or, or like, like me, I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. And I just, I just was taking tests like you. My father told me the same thing, you know? So, you know, 
I always had a lot of, I, well, I feared cops, but in a good way. Like, you know, yeah, we, yeah. It, in, in, a, in a respect way, feared them, which is, the, you know, the intimidation. It kept us in line, something that doesn't exist anymore. But we feared the police. And I always looked at them as they are the keepers of the neighborhood. They're the ones that keep us safe. All of our parents loved and respected the police. No one ever bad mouthed them. My dad always had a pay. We always had food in the fridge. We always had a roof over our head. We always went on a vacation. We had a summer house. So for me, it looked like a great job. And it was something I knew I could do. I knew I had the wit to do it. I knew I was physically capable of doing it. I was socially capable of doing it. So I jumped in and I jumped in with both feet. I got very, as you remember me, uh, even I think when we worked together, it was 2008. So I had about six years on. And I still had all of that fire in my sails, all of that wind I had. Yeah. And uh, I jumped in with both feet. I wanted to go all the way with it. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think the same thing. I, you know, I, I was, I grew up in Brooklyn too. I, I moved to Staten Island in my teens. I was always on the street. Um, we were good kids. You know, we were, we were out there, but we were worldly kids, right? We seen a lot of things. We knew what to stay away from, what not to. Um, and I just think that, you know, I know how to talk to everybody. You get that from growing up in New York, right? You know, all these different, you, you deal with a million different ethnicities, even though my neighborhoods that I grew up in were mainly Italian neighborhoods, but I still, there were black kids, there were Puerto Rican kids, there were, there were Indian kids, there were Chinese kids. And I learned different cultures in the city and I was able to speak with anyone and, you know, and then you you step in right on the heels of uh, 9-11 right? You come on. I mean, that's a, that's a scary time, man. You know, even, even us as kids growing up in New York and, um, you know, it's the city's turning now, right? It's, it's not like as bad as it was in the eighties and the nineties. It's still bad. There's still a lot of crime in the early two thousands, but, uh, you know, 2001, September 11th, you know, it just passed uh, two days ago. And, you know, that's, that was the first time in my life that I was like, I was actually really scared. I was like, oh my God. I was like, I never thought that this country could be attacked. And uh, so for you to step in right on the heels of that after, you know, you know, how, how was that? How was that for you? It was, you know, it was so fresh because it literally was like six months. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was like nine months after the towers got hit and we went in and it was all about 9-11, 9-11, 9-11 and terrorism. And <clears throat> there was just a lot of pride. There was a lot of NYPD pride, a lot of American pride. Just, it, it, I just felt like the city was very more close knit, tight knit than it, much more than it is now. But I also got spoiled of when I got out finally of the academy and went into the streets to be a cop, we were loved because we were still the heroes. You know, we were Superman and Spider-Man for a while. I mean, it went on for like two or three years. I mean, you know, you're going to, you, we went into food establishments, they wanted to feed us. People thanked us because that's how they looked at us post 9-11. That came and went, but it was nice while it lasted. I mean, like I said, I got spoiled because I thought that's how it is, you know? Yeah, no, no, I know. I mean, I, I came on in 2004, like early in 2004. And, uh, you know, it was it was still the same. You know, people respected the police, um, you know, even 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 guys. And I always I always laugh like, you know, I worked around a lot of wise guys. They were the most respectful people to me. You know what I mean? And they were they were criminals, but they were respectful. They, You know what I mean? And and it was a different feeling at that time. And New York was close. I was still a kid when 9-11 happened and I was still doing dumb stuff, hanging out in the park, drinking, whatever. And I'll never forget. In the, in the months following that, um, you know, like the cops were different people, man. They were like, hey, listen, just don't be an asshole. Get out of here. You know, the summonses were down, all that stuff, you know, that we weren't really hammering each other. The lady wasn't getting a ticket for being on her cell phone. Uh, not that cell phones were prevalent, but, you know, nonsensical things were were really being looked over for a while. And there was a huge sense of of camaraderie. I mean, and, you know, being from New York and I'm sure it hit home for us real hard. It hit the whole country, it hit the whole world. You know, so, you know. It's, it, it, it's at that point, it's an honorable profession, right? You feel privileged to serve. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe that they gave me this job that I, that I'm able to go out there and do this. Like I really, I, 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 and you know, I always felt privileged to wear that uniform e even leading up into the end. I did. I just couldn't take the way we were going, but I don't want to jump ahead with that. You know, um, just tell us, you know, how'd you start out? Where'd you start out? What were you looking to do? Like when you first get out on the street, like, well, the way I always looked at it is there's two directions you can go. There's public service and there's like the law enforcement type. 
like the law enforcement, like the active crime fighter. I wanted to be, I was 21 years old. I was very energetic. I, I still am, but I wanted to be a crime fighter. I had nothing against the public service part of it. I like helping people, but I wanted to get bad guys. I wanted to get criminals. I wanted to lower crime. I wanted that good feeling of it. So I worked in two places as a cop before I was promoted. I worked in the 6 to 6 For those of you who don't know where those are, there's uh, Coney Island and Bay Ridge. And uh, predominance of it was spent in Bay Ridge for four years. I was an anti-crime officer. Um, again, for those of you who don't know, that's the plain clothes, um, you know, plain clothes, jeans and t-shirts, unmarked cars, looking for, looking to lower the seven major crimes and also get guns off the street. And um, what else did we do as crime guys? We were on top of all of the major criminals. We lowered, you know, anything from robberies, burglaries, um, gang violence, drugs guns. We went after uh, GLAs when cars uh, were up, commercial burgs. You know, I mean, anything that was major crime area, and of course we backed up the cops on their uh, daily routines on the emergency calls, but four years of my, uh, my white shield time before I was promoted to sergeant was spent as an anti-crime cop. And I loved every minute of it. I worked with amazing cops, great bosses. I mean, that's where I learned to appreciate the special ops guys like me and you, like, you know, special ops. That's why I never bothered them when I was in one, two, three. Yeah. Is because I used to say the special op guys are a means of production in crime reduction. It's true. You're the means of production. The patrol cops are busy answering 911 calls and performing public service. The special ops guys, like the crime guys, the snoo guys, the bad guys, those are the guys who lower the crime, put the bad guys away. That's why I always took care of those guys. So I was one of them. And we did an excellent job at it. We knew our stuff. We knew where they were. We knew what they were doing. We followed the trends. We followed the crimes, the patterns. We worked very close knit with the detective squad who had eye cards, who was wanted, who they're looking at. We were on top, sharing information, backing up patrol, going after the bad guys, locking them up. And crime was lowering. Again, it was a different time because we were allowed to do police work back then. This was under the Ray Kelly regime, which I, let me tell you something, 12 years, I remember Bloomberg and Kelly. People could say what they wanted about Bloomberg and Kelly, but they had crime lowered in the city and they took care of their people. Cops never had to worry about doing their job when Kelly was the commissioner. If someone had to get disciplined, they got disciplined, but cops didn't lose their job and we didn't worry about, no, you can't do this, don't do that. What were you about this? We were concerned with go do your job. And then it, it, it'll all, the chips will fall and everybody will be okay. You do the right thing, you do the right thing and everything will be okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, that's, and you know, that's, that's a perfect tale of what, you know, an anti-crime cop does that we no longer have in this department. Um, you know, and that's, you know, and there's another thing with that, like the omnipresence that we brought, and I don't think anyone understands that, and I don't think anybody could ever calculate how many people didn't commit crime, how many people didn't carry guns, how many people were afraid when they were doing something criminal to come into New York City, even for a pass-through, drive-through. Perps used to drive around. They used to drive around New York City. They're like, oh, we're not going to go in there. We're going to get stopped because we were out there. And like you said, we were putting a ton of work into it, right? It wasn't this, we're just out there stopping everyone. No, we were actually looking at the crimes that were taking place each night. We were going in on our own time. You know, overtime wasn't big at that time, right? You couldn't get a lot of overtime at that time. We're going in on our, over, our own time, researching where we're taking crimes, looking at, at who our major players are, who are the guys that are committing these crimes, and actually going after them, targeting enforcement. And, you know, and, and that... We went away from all that. We went away from broken windows. We went away from using minor crimes. We we have no ability to even put someone in jail at this point for for even a weekend. You know, even someone that's just you know maybe maybe I don't know the guy. Uh, he's mounting off. He doesn't want to listen to the cops. He's a public nuisance. There's no fear of us anymore. We don't. We lost all omnipresence and and that was like guys like you brought to the table right because you were out there every night you were hunting the the guys that were out there dealing drugs breaking into houses breaking into cars robbing people they knew who we were 
and they knew we were out that night and they would didn't want it. They're like, they would see who, whoever's working and, and you would know they would go to a different prison. See you later. I'm out of here. We used to, we used to change our tours. Remember like around the crime trends, we would change it. Cause like I said, the overtime wasn't there. We would change our tours. We would do a six to two is eight to fours midnight. We do day tours. If the birds were up, you know, cause, uh, so we were changing our tours around it. And the main thing was, is that the quality of life violations worked wonders for two reasons. One, now people don't have quality of life. It's disgusting out there. I mean, the way we're living out there, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, you know, vagrants, petty criminals, it's just, you know, roaming the streets. It's, it's filthy, it's noisy. Quality of life violations kept a lot of the trash in, a lot of the trash in. They, the, the guns are out there. And we could see that, we could see that right in the numbers. You know, when we were out there with targeted enforcement, the guns weren't on them. The guns were in wheel wells. Remember, they were in trash cans. They were in people's houses. So when you wanted to use your gun, what did you have to do? You had to go get the gun. Now, the guns are on you because they know we're not touching you. Even when we, we know they got guns. We know they got guns. It's just, a, it's a sixth sense that we have that the general public don't have, which is why they give us this authority to do this work is because we have that sense to know, you know, I don't, that's why I don't like to say the word racial profiling. I like to say criminal profiling. We with experience gain the knowledge to criminally profile people. We know who's doing something bad or is about to do something bad. We watch and then we act if need be. And it was preventative policing. We would prevent the crimes from happening. How many guns have you, you know how many guns you've pulled I know how many I pulled. That's one less gun on the street. Even if the case didn't get prosecuted, it's a gun we got off the street. Now we don't get the guns off the street. I mean, now we, I'm out now. But unfortunately, what do they call them now? Uh, public safety? Public That's safety what, officers or something. Yeah, it's a, the new anti-crime. They're, anti -crime. Not, they're yeah. not equipped and capable of getting these guns. It's not their fault. I know they want to go get these guns off the street. They're just not equipped and capable and not given the resources and supervision to do it. Not it's data. all fear-based now. Fear-based policing. Fear-based policing. We let the public police us, is what I see. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, I, again, I don't know how when we went away from policing minor crimes like marijuana, drinking in public, smoking in public, um, you, drug use, defecating, pissing. How do you, get, how do you stop anybody? Like, what do you do? Like, the majority of, of my arrests stemmed from marijuana. I pulled you, I waited, for the, I waited for you to light a joint in the car. I pulled the car over. I got what I knew was in that car. You know what I mean? Um, and then we, 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 if we came up with nothing that night, you were a bad guy, you had a bad record, bring you in, interrogate you. That's how we got most of the information, right? Oh, you know anybody that shot anyone? Who's got a gun? Who was breaking into houses? Who was breaking into cars? And now we lost all the intelligence that we had. And they are pulling guns. They're pulling guns at an exorbitant rate, but they're doing it in a non-proactive department. They're doing it responding to 911 calls, routine jobs. And, and you know, you, you got uh, New York City Mayor Adams. He's, he's touting it. Uh, I think uh, three months ago, they had already pulled 3,500 guns for the year. And he's touting it as a, as a, as a victory. And I'm like, that's a, a failure. I'm like, people didn't ca exactly what you said. People didn't carry guns when we were when we were cops. You know, I remember as a rookie cop driving through the one two old projects and uh, great guys. They take us they take us to Mariners Harbor and they're showing us all the kids by the windows. He's like, look at the kid in the window. Look, he's going to hand something up to the window. He's like, yeah, he just handed the gun up. They were standing by windows because that's how afraid they were of the police at that time, you know, and and. And that deterred so much criminality and, and that's all gone. You know, it's, it's, it's a shame, but you know, you did get a good run. So, you know, like leading up to your, your sergeant's exam and all that, like everything was still good, right? Like what, what, what were your thoughts at that time? You know, you know, I had a great run. Um, I w it was full speed ahead. I was sprinting a marathon is what I was doing. I was doing, I, I thought I was doing an excellent job. You know, I'm, I'm highly decorated. I'm not, I'm not looking to toot my own horn, but I was obtaining all of this knowledge and experience. I was working with amazing cops that went on illustrious careers. And when I got promoted, I said to myself, okay, well, I'll, I'll start over at this rank and I'll see where this goes. I could still do the police work and I could hand off my knowledge and experience. I could, you know, 
properly and I, I take care of my guys and also give them the knowledge so they can pass it down. It's like anything else. It's education without the books. It's education without the books. So even like I said, they, when I got promoted in 2008, they sent me out to the one, two, three. I was doing midnights. I mean, not a very, um, I, I pretty much got my feet wet with the supervisory aspect of it. So I was there for about a year. And then I went to the 120 and I was in charge of this group uh, called IRT, the, the new guys, like if they you know impact and there's, you know, there's always like a name, neighborhood stabilization, the new guys, pretty much. I was given those guys and I loved it because it was like having like, I was like a, like, like a, a pre-K teacher. Like you're molding these young minds. These cops came out of the academy and they were in a busy neighborhood and they wanted, I grabbed the guys that were like me that wanted to be law enforcement, that wanted to be crime fighters. And I grabbed them and I said, here's what we're gonna do. If you will do whatever I say, when I say it, how I say it, you will be okay. I will protect you. I will never steer you in a bad direction and I will never make you do something that I'm not gonna personally do with you ever. Never have I ever told someone to do something where I wasn't gonna be next to that person doing it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, I, I used to go to court more than any other supervisor I know testifying for some of the things we did out there, but we did an excellent job. We were all over the one to oh, and we were just, uh, we scooped up everybody. Like I said, from, from car thieves to the robberies, to guns, to drugs, to gangs. We were on top of everything that was going on. You know, it was, pre it was preemptive attacks. We knew when something bad was gonna happen. The retaliatory shootings. We, I can't tell you how many times we prevented retaliatory shootings just by the omnipresence going out there, hitting off all the quality of life violations. The bad guys didn't want to get in their cars because they knew we would be on them because we knew they were up to, there was something bad was going to happen. Now this is looked at, this would be a travesty if we did this now. Oh you yeah, know, they, they would call you racist and everything oh, else. Oh, the racist, book. racist. And you know what, the, and the irony of it is that all of these communities I worked in, even like when I worked in the 6 -0, the community thanked us for what we were doing. Absolutely. I mean, I've got more thank yous in the tougher, more violent neighborhoods. Any ethnicity, I got more thanks and gratitude. They were more thankful and praising our presence than in some of the nicer neighborhoods, like when I worked in the one, two, three, out in you know, South Trust, South Island. They wanted us there because we were lowering crime. We were protecting their kids, you know? their quality of life, their livelihoods. Absolutely. They were able to not get hit by straight bullets. Look at what's going on now. Look at what's going on now. People, look at the subways. You know, the subways actually were good for a long time. I mean, what, 15, 20 years, we had a good run of the subways. There were six major subway systems in the world. We have one of the most intricate subway systems, most complex, and probably one of the best subway systems in the world. It's like a it's it's like a demilitarized zone now. I mean, I have I don't want to get into what I do now. I do a little part time job. I go to Manhattan. I take the train. I shouldn't be scared to take the train. I got a gun, and I got training, and it's bad. And I actually feel bad. I'm empathetic to people that actually have to live like this and take the train every day, who just want to go somewhere, whether it's work or to take care of family or just to travel. You know, tourists tourists come here. They spend all sorts of money. They give the city all sorts of revenue. And then they have to come here with these tourists. See, I don't know how they ever come back. I, most of them don't. Most of the people I, I, you know, I'm down in Florida now. I talk to people now. They're like, oh, you know, I used to like New York. I used to go there every few years. I'm never going back. And I'm like, it, you know, it, and, and just and just to the, your point, like what we're, we're doing, the communities we serve a huge disservice. And it's not us. You know, it's the media, it's the politicians. Uh, and, and like you said, you know, you're, you're in a black neighborhood, you're in a Chinese neighborhood, you're in a Jewish neighborhood, you're in an Italian neighborhood, whatever neighborhood you're in, the overwhelming majority of those people love us. The criminals don't like us. You would never know that from turning on your local news station because they're going to have Al Sharpton and everybody else running their mouth about what we do when they've never done it um and you know and demonizing you know and basically what what is all this done what is all of this depolicing done it's it's made those communities that bill de blasio said he was going to protect 
It's made shootings go up. Mur uh, 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 cr murders are going up. Crimes through the roof. Quality of life. Businesses are fleeing. You, you, people are worried about taking their kids to school, you know? And I'm like, you know, and, and, and the whole liberal mindset of that, oh, you know, you guys are, you guys are too much. You're enforcing, um, you're enforcing disproportionately on the black and brown community. And I'm like, hey, you know, for a long time, Italians – like myself, the Italian community and the Jewish community were responsible for all the crime in New York City. Should we have not policed them hard? And this, we, we criminally profile, like you said, a race is the part, your race is a part of that profile. Just happens to be who you are. Like you said, South Shore, Staten Island, all Italian kids. Look at all my arrests. Look at all my stop question frisks. They're all kids that look like me, talk like me, dress like me. But they'll never bring that up. Because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, you know. Those are the kids that were doing the burglars. Who should I go after? Should, who should I be looking at? Who should get the brunt of the minor crimes? Should I bother a little Hasidic kid who's re, who the, the zero percent of their population is responsible for committing that crime? When I know, based on the the data that we have and the times the crimes are getting committed and the descriptions of the the people that are getting committed, and even then we're still not stopping you because you're a young Italian kid in that neighborhood in that time zone, still even then we're waiting for you to do something, right? And we're waiting for you to, we're not just jumping out and tossing people because of the way they look. Well, even then we're sitting down, we're watching, we're waiting for you to, to commit a crime. You know, I, I, you know, that, that whole narrative made me laugh. You know, the, the, you know, uh, where were you, you know, you, you eventually go to the detective squad. How long did you stay like in the precinct work before you, 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 all right. I put in for the bureau. I'll tell you right now, 2012, I got in, I did my last 10 years in the bureau, 2012. Okay. I got into detective squad. Um, <clears throat> I went to the seven, six squad, which was, you know, downtown Brooklyn, South Brooklyn, Carroll yep. Gardens, Red Hook. I spent four and a half years there over there. I was a squad CO. We generally didn't have a lieutenant over there, so I was in charge of the squad over there. Um, excellent place to start investigatory work because we did get the violence. We had two housing developments that were very violent. There was a lot of bad major crime going on over there. The brownstone part of the area, we were getting creamed in burglaries. We had a lot of methadone clinics down there. So I got my feet wet in the bureau in the 7-6. I earned some bones over there. We did a really good job. There were some gangs over there. We did some takedowns. Um, we, we had a, 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 we had an amazing clearance rate over there. From there, they moved me to the seven one, which was crown Heights, completely different animal. I mean, that was a busy place. Um, yeah. I was a Bram sergeant there for those who don't know that that's burglary, robbery, apprehension module. So I had detectives assigned to me that strictly did burglaries and robberies and we did gun enhancements, but predominantly burglaries and robberies. And I had an answer for the burgs and the robs. From there, I did a short stay in Brooklyn South Night Watch. That was on my own volunteer, volunteering to do Night Watch, which was pretty much just uh, looking over during the midnight and responding to the major incidents and patching up the crime scenes until the squads got in at eight in the morning. After that, I moved on when midnight wasn't working for my family at the time. I went to the 6-3, Brooklyn Avenue, um, just pretty much a whip. I was just a sergeant. I was a third wheel over there. I got promoted out of there. I got the special assignment money out of there. Uh, then from there, it was the 6-0 back in Coney Island. And I ended up in this, I ended my career in the 7-0 squad. Very busy place. Good, definitely a good place to end. But, uh, you know, it got, and, and that, that was after 2020. And that was when it got really, it went from like, it went from medium to hot. I mean, we went into the red at that point. And the crime just flew through the roof. The violence flew through the roof. And that's when the major changes started that pushed me out the door. Because I thought I was going to be a 25-year guy, maybe even 30. I'm only 41 years old. Yeah, I'm no, only 41. I, I know. I know. That's, that, that's me, too. Yeah. You know, that's me, too. I thought I was do 30 years easy, you know. Um, but, I, you know, but I noticed a change. You go to the squad in 12. Um, but I was still, I was a young sergeant. I got promoted in 12. So I was a young sergeant in 12. I want to say de Blasio gets in 2013. He wins that election by, by 14 and 15. I'm already like, I don't even know what to do anymore. I don't even know how to be an anti-crime cop. We still have anti-crime at that time. They demonized stop question frisk. I never really cared about it because I never really truly ever did a stop question frisk report. I waited for you to commit a crime. I followed you. 
I waited and I, and I trained my guys the same way. Wait for them to do something so we're not articulating. We don't have to worry about our stop being bad. Like wait, wait until they do anything. I don't care what it is, littering, whatever it is, and then we'll 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 investigate from that. Well, that'll be what leads us to a stop. So yeah, like as as much as we did. So I didn't care. So like when we when they demonized stop, question, and frisk, I was like, whatever, get rid of that number. Who cares? It's unnecessary anyway. I will just follow and we'll go after the minor crimes. But like immediately, they start decriminalizing everything. So I'm on the street and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? You know, and then and then and then the Aragona incident happens. And I, I watch a kid who reminds me of me, reminds me of you, reminds me of hundreds of other guys that I looked up to guys that I, like when I came on this job, I wanted to be like same as you. Right. You wanted to go into anti-crime. You wanted to be a cop. You wanted to police the streets. And, and I didn't know Danny Penaleo, but I knew a lot of guys that knew him. And I watched that video and I did that same thing a thousand times. And not only did I do it that way, I was trained to a T, to a T to take him down, take him down to the ground. Once he's handcuffed, they don't tell you how to handcuff him, right? Whatever it is, he's fighting with you. And I thought they were very gentle. I thought they were very professional the way they took him down. They got him handcuffed. They rolled him to his side to promote free breathing, and they called an ambulance. That, to a T, was my training in the police academy. And and I watched that, and that really made me second-guess what the hell I'm doing. Let me tell you something. You can only see so much from a video. Now, I knew Danny, and I also knew Eric Garner from when I worked over in the 112. We used to be on his case a lot for the illegal things that he was doing in the park over there. But you got to realize something. I'm five foot 11. I'm almost six feet tall. Danny Pandaleo is about six two. He's taller than me. And he's a lot bigger than me. He looks like a midget on that video. People don't realize how much of a monster Eric Garner was. He was a huge individual. And what people need to understand is the danger. Someone of that size and, mag size and magnitude, the damage they could do to you. I mean, you have to be aggressive. You, you have to take control of a situation like that. And honestly, from a, med, from a medical standpoint of it, I mean, yeah, he had a heart attack. If he didn't have a heart attack right then and there, he would have had the heart attack in the car or he would have had a heart attack in the cell. He was in very poor health. He was 44 years old. He was obese. He's probably died. He probably was all riled up. And that heart attack was coming. I'm going to do it a chokehold, all right? Absolutely. Saying, have you, I'm sure you've been choked before. I've been choked before. When I'm choked, I can't talk. I'm not able to say I can't breathe. I can tap. That's it. But I can't say I can't breathe. Yeah, it looks good on a T-shirt running around with the I can't breathe shirt. But that's not the reality of it. The reality of it is, is that someone committing a crime was going to get arrested. And the police took control of the situation. And they, they took him down with minimal force. No one struck him. Nobody punched him. They took him down with minimum force. Nobody was kicking him when he was down. These are the things people don't look at. Yeah, no, These absolutely. People, I, I, I think do. he was taken, well, not think. I know he was taken down gently. And like I said, you got to realize how big this guy was. He was huge. He had to be about six foot six. And I can't even estimate his weight. That's a dangerous guy. He could really put a hurting on somebody. Oh, absolutely. If I, I was there, I would have, I would have done this. I would have done the same thing. What do they call that? The technical term, the seatbelt takedown. Yeah, like they a seatbelt hold. A seatbelt hold. A seatbelt seat hold. Yeah, yeah. They weren't crushing his windpipe. They had to take him down to the ground to get his hands behind his back. Yeah. He had a heart attack. To me, a death in police custody. And I'm not ashamed to say it. I've been saying this since day one. Yeah, absolutely. A death in police custody. Yeah, and what nobody talks about is how gentle that takedown was, that they were behind the store window. All Eric Garner had to do was go backwards with Danny on his back, and they're both dead. They're either going to go through that plate glass window, and it's going to cut them in half. It's going to come right down on them and cut them in half, and they're going to be dead. You know, and, and nobody ever, ever, ever talked about that. And, and you're right. It was Eric Garner's own actions that it was, it was the blockages in his heart 
based with the adrenaline that he felt from his own actions. If he would have stayed calm, if he didn't resist arrest, if he didn't commit a crime that day, let's just start back there. If he didn't commit a crime that day, he wouldn't have even had a police interaction. So now he has the police interaction. All right, just be a man. You've been arrested a million times. You know what the hell's going to happen. You know, go through this. No, instead, he gets all worked up. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere. And you're right. I I said the same thing. I, I My thing always was, and I lost a lot of... Like, you know, I, at the time I was still young, I was still going out and, and like my wife's friends, husbands and all them, everybody became a police critic. And I'm like, that guy was going to, that guy was going to die when he was crossing the street. If it was out of red light and then it turned green, the minute he sped up, he was going to die. You know, this poor kid just happened to go out there and, and, and he's the kind of cop you want, right? Cause he's the cop that's going out there. You own a business, you live in that neighborhood, your wife works in that neighborhood, your kids go to school in that neighborhood. That's the kind of guy you want there. He didn't do anything wrong, that kid. And, and that really, that turned my career a lot, man. That was, I, I really started hating the job at that point. I really did. I was like, I don't even know what to tell my guys. We were doing anti-crime. I had all these young kids with me. I'm like, I don't even know what to tell them because I'm watching this. And I'm like, if, if this kid gets fired, like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't even know what to do anymore. Like, you know, they, they, they decriminalize it. The mayor's on TV crying, um, you know, and, 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 yeah, you know, and then, and eventually the kid, the kid winds up getting fired by the, by James O'Neill, who the same guy who was chief of patrol that day that went to the one, two, oh, and told him, oh, don't worry. You did everything right. You have nothing to worry about, you know? So, uh, I, you know, that was, a, that was a bad. Yeah. Time. O'Neill, O'Neill also demonized Hugh Barry, who, did what we trained him to do. We trained him that when someone's attacking you with a scissor and or a baseball bat, that is deadly physical force and you can meet it with deadly physical. We trained him to do what he did. And O'Neill called it a failure. Am I living in the twilight zone? We're supposed to trust this guy now. That was his first day's commissioner. Yep. First day, O'Neill, you failed. O'Neill, you failed us on day one. I was done with him since then. Yeah, you know I mean, what? Get some balls and tell it like it is. We tr- the cop was getting attacked with the scissor, and the cop was getting attacked with the bat, and he decided to meet that physical force with the deadly physical force that we trained him to do. O'Neill, you suck, and you failed. You failed, O'Neill. Not Hugh Barry. Yeah. Not Danny Pantaleo either. Danny didn't fail. He effected an arrest with minimal force used to make the arrest. You failed on that too. Absolutely. Because it didn't have to go that way. It didn't have to go that way. Absolutely. And, and Hugh Barry, that's, that's another one, right? You're wearing the shirt right now, Midnight Platoon, right? They have a shirt. They have a shirt with what we used to shoot at, right? What, what, what do we used to shoot at? What, what, when was it shoot and when was it not shoot? Shoot, they not had, shoot. Uh, they, had a guy with, they had a guy with a wallet. I remember I had like a police shield in it. They had a guy with a bat. Yep. They had a guy with a knife. Yep. The training was baseball bat and knife. Yep. That, that actual scenario could have been one of those made-up scenarios that they do in the range. Have somebody with a fake baseball bat and a fake knife. It's almost comical that like there was an issue with that. Absolutely. There was an issue with that. The, the craziest thing about that one is it's like a month later after Hugh Barry, after that incident happens with Hugh Barry and he, this kid, this poor kid. And now he's still on the ringer, right? He passed, they passed him up on the lieutenant's test. He, you know, he's still on the ringer, this poor kid. I don't know what's going on with him. You know, I, I, I hope I pray to God that some, some type of common sense comes over people. But the craziest thing is like a month after that, there's an exact similar shooting, but now the body cams are out. When Hugh Barry goes, there was no body cams out. Now the body cams out. Similar scenario. They're in an apartment building. They're inside of an apartment. Guy breaches a door. Person comes at him with a knife. Shoots. They applaud him. Oh, he did a great job. I'm like, well, well, how is that a good job? And that wasn't a good job. You know, it, it, you, you know that that's racial profiling. That's discrimination. You know what I mean? Some people could charge you with a bat and some people can't like what I, I don't understand. So if I charge you with a bat, I'm getting shot. But if, 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 a, if a, a black woman charges me with a bat, she, she could do that. She's allowed to, you know, and, and that's, that was like, there's so much mixed messaging at that time, man. 
And, and I agree with you. I think he's a failure. I, I keep saying till today, I said my last police commissioner was Ray Kelly. My next my next one was Bill de Blasio. And then now it was Eric Adams. I, n- I never had another police commissioner after Ray Kelly. The The police department's been totally, totally politicized. And, and you know, the, not only are they throwing us under the bus as police officers and using us as pawns, they're failing the community. It's it's. It's crazy. So, so like, so bring us up, you know, it's 2020, you know, COVID hits. Where are you about that point? Uh, at that point? I was in the 6-0 squad. Um, the us bureau guys, we didn't have body cams. So the rule was they wanted us to come in and be in uniform and do our regular duties, but in uniform in case they had to mobilize us, but they really tried to avoid, I didn't get actually mobilized at any of those events because they really didn't want to use us because, A, we didn't have the body cams. And, B, we didn't have all of this, quote, unquote, new training of how to deal with crowds. I dealt – my first crowd was in 2003 was the anti-war demonstrations in Manhattan. Now, I'm not going to get into details, but we handled the crowd a little differently. Um, we, the crowd followed the rules and regulations of protesting in the streets. They had to be in their little pens and they can make all the noise they want. They couldn't have sticks. <clears throat> they, there was certain things they couldn't do. They couldn't block traffic. But now there's a, crowd control is a lot different. A guy like me, I wouldn't look good out there handling a crowd. And I'm not talking about any kind of abuse or anything. I'm, I don't abuse people. I don't bully people either. But I mean, just like handling a crowd and doing police work and preserving peace and safety of citizens and protesters. I wouldn't be good at that now because I do things a little differently. Yeah. I handle things differently. But so we pretty much hung out in the squad. We had the news channels on and we were watching the August cameras and just shaking our heads. I mean, that's really what we were doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you're right. We, the, I say now we used to control the crowd, but now the crowd controls us. My first interaction with crowd control was the Republic National Convention. And I, I don't think, yeah. 2004, I, I don't think that you could make a better, a better way of, of, of keeping people safe, keeping property safe, keeping businesses in the largest city in the world open and keeping traffic running, you know, and, and the Antifa at that time, I think they were, they had a different name, but they were, uh, they said they were going to come here and burn New York city down. Um, they said they were going to come here and burn it down and they didn't burn anything down. We all spent a few days, anyone that acted up, um, basically what we did as a police department is we took an orange net, we wrapped a crowd, if there was a rowdy crowd, and we locked up everybody in that crowd. And, and, you know, we would give you the dispersal order three times. If after the third time, everybody gets locked up. If you did not disperse, you went to Pier 76, they left you there, where they did a mass arrest process. But in that mass arrest process, as opposed to 2020, we didn't let you out in three hours. We let you out in three days and we trickled you out every 45 minutes after you ate three days of bologna sandwiches. And you weren't going back out there to think you were going to burn down New York City again. You just wanted to go back to whatever state you came from and go home and sleep in your bed and take a nice shower. As opposed to 2020, where we were locking guys up two and three times in the same night, same rabble rouses. We're just letting them back out. Yeah, no big deal. Totally energized coming out and 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 destroying New York City. And, you know, we, it was an embarrassment. It, to me, I, I, I got mobilized. I was out. I thought it was an embarrassment. I was like, I was mortified. I'm like, what are we even doing here? If we're not, if you're not going to unleash the dogs, what are we even doing here? Like, that's it. Like, because that's what we needed to do at that time. Anybody that didn't listen to us, I don't care if you were getting the groceries. And, and that's a dangerous situation. If I told you to get out of here and you didn't, that's an arrest. That's an arrest. That's how we keep people safe. That's how we keep public order. That's how we keep your businesses from burning and, and everything else. Um, so, yeah. So, so 2020. A lawful order. A lawful order. It's not a, a lawful request or a favor. It's an order. That's what needs to come back is giving somebody an order and then failing to comply to your order there's a consequence you get yep. detained yep no absolutely um and and then you know and then and then you know the leadership at that time is lacking right you like you said you're sitting around watching the tv right shit's going on like you know it's it's it, you know the 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 messaging i don't even know what the hell was going on i, I know the riots happened i know that every night of that we got demonized by every politician that it was our fault like what we did. 
you know, and I'm watching videos. I'm like, I don't, I don't see what any of these guys are doing wrong. I mean, you're, you're I, we're seeing things that we never seen before ever. You know, you're in the middle of fifth Avenue and 52nd street standing in the middle of the street while thousands and thousands of people are smashing windows of, of businesses. We, no one's ever dealt with that. You don't have the manpower to deal with it at this point. We're so spread out. You have no, you have a basically a stand down order. You don't even know what to do. And then, and then, the media is chopping up videos. I remember the video of the kid pointing his gun at the crowd. And for three days, people were calling for him to be fired. People were calling for him. Oh, who the hell are you to pull your gun out? And I'm like, hey, I'm just looking at that corner. I wasn't even there. I'm scared. I'll pull my gun out. I'm allowed to pull my gun out whenever I'm in fear for my life or anybody else is in fear for their life. And, and you know, and they, they Maybe tried to- Maybe throw a weapon. Did anyone ask the cop, did you see something? Because if he says, yes, I saw a weapon, there's the, the, it's over. That's it. You pulled it out. You pulled it out. You saw a weapon. Yeah. And so basically, basically what happens is we do, three days later, the leadership finally decides to release body camera of the other thing. And what happened was the kid was standing there with his lieutenant, and his lieutenant gets smashed in the head with a brick. And that's when he pulls his gun out because they're throwing bricks at them. And it, that conveniently never made its way into the media until three days later when our leadership um, at the time decided that it was safe enough to give the actual video of the truth of what happened. You know, uh, disgusting, disgusting. Um, so, so, all right. So, so tell us, like you said, you, you know, you said like, you know, things start changed in 2020 for you. Like, like what, how, like what, what started happening for you? Well, it, it started a little before, but it really shifted into the sixth year in 2020 is that I always call the police work, uh, NYPD, a lifestyle career because you pretty much revolve your lifestyle around your job. Uh, that's why I call it a lifestyle career. You have to make changes. But what got a little bit too much for me is it got too much. It got to the point where everything, where the only way you will survive is if you go to work, do nothing, go home and stay in your house. You can't talk. You can't associate with anybody. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. You can't defend your family. You, you, you know, it, it became too much. Everything became a viral video. Everything was a rule. They tell you how to think, what to say, what not to say, what to wear. At what point do people say, you know, when you, you take an oath, you take an oath when you're hired. It's the same oath that the president takes, same oath that our lawmakers take. And what I always thought in my head was, you're taking this oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. So your job is you're taking the oath to defend the Constitution, but your right to completely stripped away. And it has nothing to do with What's that term that they like to use? Uh, actions prejudicial to the good order of the department? No, it's anything you do, you will get burned for, you will get in trouble for. You want to hear something? Listen to this. In 2020, I have a Facebook account. I made what was considered a disparaging remark against Black Lives Matter. I called them terrorists and human garbage. I'm not sorry what I wrote. I, I think that they, I, I think and know that they are terrorists and human garbage. They advocate for violence. That's what terrorists do. You know, they're lawful, they're anarchy, and they advocate for violence and chaos and disorder. And a year later, I had an answer for this in a GO-15 a department hearing in uh, the Detective Bureau Inspection Unit. I had an answer for this because someone leaked it out. I had an answer because, and that, that, that's first, A, that's my freedom of speech. B, whose side are you on? They're the bad guys. They're the ones hurting us, hurting the public. They're the ones that destroyed the property and ransacked the stores. They did Curtis Lee, but didn't they break his jaw? He was trying to, uh, he was trying to, yeah. they threw a bike at him. Remember he was protecting the business from being burned down. They threw a yeah. bicycle at him. That wasn't the police. I was backing up the police. I made a remark on social media that I'm not sorry for which is my freedom of speech, and it doesn't represent the police department. It, re it represented Tommy Gambadella, not the police department. And, and Tommy, it. that's a good point, though, right? You didn't, you weren't there in uniform. You didn't say Sergeant Tommy Gambadella, right? You didn't say that Until you I retired. Until I retired, nothing on my social media, anything police-related, 
blue line related, uniform related, and I purposely didn't put anything on there related to it for that reason. Purposely didn't do that for that reason because I know that that's like the catch-all. Oh yeah, you look, you're, you're making the department look bad. There's a picture of you in uniform. And you're saying this. I went on as just me. The first time I put anything on there in uniform was when I put that the, the famous post when I retired, right? The big yeah. famous post. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? It was probably the same fucking guy that that dropped your fucking dropped a log on you for for your first comment that that did that. You know, and and that's another thing, like the jealousy in the department, like wh- whoever leaked your stuff to the, the media and whoever leaked that to IAB, honestly, they have no integrity because and, and I always said that, like, you know, you're a police officer and you see something wrong and you say that this is this is an integrity issue. You shouldn't there shouldn't be an anonymous button. I, I, I've, I see that you're doing something wrong. How you doing? Yeah, this is Lieutenant John McCarry, tax number 935220. Yeah, this is what uh, Tommy did. Why do you got to be a little rat fuck and not give your name how is that okay like that's not even like it's your own social media account you said they're terrorists and human garbage they said that you're a white supremacist a murderer a racist all of these other things and they're actually doing things and threatening us and assaulting people what'd you do you made a facebook post you made a personal facebook post which is your first amendment right and And i had an answer for it i had an answer i felt like an asshole going in there and explaining it to two guys that have been on the job less time than me, right? Yeah. And I mean, I don't blame them. They're doing, I'm, I'm sure they got to an answer to a higher authority, but shame on the higher authority then. Shame on somebody for having that have to trickle down to me going down there, having, having to close out a case, a case. Take your investigatory time to something. Listen, you, you want to do corruption and serious misconduct? Investigate corruption and investigate serious misconduct. Don't investigate. Tommy Gambadella and his stupid Facebook post he probably made when he was home eating something because he was a little upset that day at what was going on. Yeah, absolutely. You're at a protest. How many, how many times you come back from a protest? You work 18 hours. 12. I'm rambling the whole next day. My wife's like, shut up. But I can't, I can't calm down. You get yelled at for 10 hours, 15 hours. You're on your feet. You're, you're dealing with crazy shit, you know, and, and, you know, yeah, like why can't we vent? Why, why, why is it that that we're not allowed to have freedom of speech as individuals? I, I get the whole don't represent the department thing. I, I, I believe in that. You know, I have a company. I don't want to. I don't want any of my employees running around misrepresenting my company. I understand that, but like, you, you know, know, what needs to be questioned. The main thing, and I really hope there's a lot of cops listening to this right now. I hope word gets out of what I'm about to say. Who decides the standards when you say? Oh, what you said was offensive and it doesn't represent the department in a good way. On whose standards? Who's making these standards up? I'm certainly not. You're certainly not. Someone's making these standards up. Those standards, who makes them needs to be questioned. Because whose side do you want? Absolutely. On, on the side of, of, of your constitutional rights or your side to pr- 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 um, you know, suppress your rights to say something? Who's making these standards of what's offensive? It's like that is a thing. You can't have certain things on your on your personal vehicle. That, by the way, was made because of me. That's another story. That whole thing. I'd they love to hear it, Tommy. Tell us. Let, let, let's hear it. All right. When I when I was working in the six three, I had a I had a blue Toyota Tacoma at the time, a pickup truck, and I like to um, you know me. I like oh, yeah. to decorate it up. I had a lot of like decals. And I had magnets I, instead of bumper stickers. I had like the bumper magnets. Yeah, yeah. And I had I had a motif. Of like a concert, like a like a conservative, pro life, pro NRA, pro America. And I think I had a Trump magnet on there. I had a couple, and I had a middle finger magnet. I actually uh, is this is this just an audio cast or is this a? Uh, it doesn't video? matter. If you want to step off? Step off for a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, so I, I, yeah, get it. Show it. Yeah. I have it on my refrigerator. I have this. I had this on the back of my truck. (laughs) You know, for those of you that can't see it, it's a big middle finger. It's a big, it's about, it's about 10 inches big. It's a big middle finger. I think it's funny. I think it's funny. Doesn't say anything on it, but it's a middle finger. Now I had this on the back of my truck. I did not have anything police related on my truck because I don't like to attract attention to the fact that I'm a cop and I got a gun on for obvious reasons. The car's parked on Brooklyn Avenue. Right. Not the greatest of neighborhoods, 
So I had these decals on it. Some street lawyer from the block took a bunch of pictures of it and made these intricate flyers. Um, this really was, uh, this was a work of art of me walking to my truck and all of the things on the truck. And he was at, had like a Gadsden flag on my truck. He was analyzing all of the things on my truck and how that they are, um, how that they are, they represent white supremacy. And um, pretty much it, it was all offensive. And what he did was he sent copies of his stuff. He tried to get like the neighborhood rallied behind him to send it. At the time, Eric Adams was the borough president. He sent it to Eric Adams. He sent it to Jumani Williams, who is an asshole. Absolutely. And he sent it to CCRB and he sent it to the 6-3 precinct CO. And naturally, it went, it went all over the place. At the time, I'll, I'll leave him nameless. The CO of the 6 3 precinct, very nice guy, says, Tommy, legally, I can't make you take those things off your truck. And before he can go any further, I said, you know what, boss, in the, in the interest of a little peace for everybody. I'll just voluntarily take them off. You can tell people you told me to take them off, take the credit. I'll take them off just to shut everybody up because I'm sick of hearing about this. They had these flyers. They were putting flyers all over the neighborhood in yeah. people's windshields with my, my vehicle information and pictures of me on it, telling me um, he's white, he carries a gun, he, he hates they're, us. They're you know, basically like, doxing you, right? They're putting your family in danger. Yeah, they're my license plate was on there. And... Shortly afterwards, another guy I know, I'll leave him nameless, sent me a copy of the order that now our personal vehicles can't have offensive materials on it in any way, shape, or form. But then, like I said before, who decides the standards of offensive? Now, listen, the middle finger thing I could understand, fine. I'll give you that one. But what's next? My NRA? My NRA decal? I'm an NRA member. I'm a lifetime member, and I support the NRA, I support the Second Amendment. I'm a gun owner. You, I'm you, took, a oath to uphold, I'm you took an oath to uphold the Constitution. So I hope I hope that you support the Second Amendment. Absolutely. Right? I have another decal pro-life. I'm a pro-life Christian on it. Yes. I was celebrating when the Supreme Court shot down the Roe v. Wade. I, yes, I support pro-life. That's me. It might not be you. It might not be other people, but it's me. So if Absolutely. I want to put it on my personal vehicle, who's going to decide the standard of that being offensive? What about the stuff that offends me and you? Absolutely. And that, and what about that, the stuff that offends me yeah. and you? And why is your voice not okay? Why is your opinion not okay? Who are you hurting by stating your opinion? You're just bringing your voice to the table, right? That's it. This is what I believe. Okay. I'm not telling you're not telling any, you're not forcing it down anybody else's throat. Uh, but that's, again, that's a failure on our unions, man, because, you know, I, I know you like, it, it dropped, right? You know, it probably dropped about a year and a half ago, the, the matrix, the disciplinary matrix. Um, I went through that. I looked at it. Hate speech. I'm like, what's hate speech? I support Donald Trump. Is that hate speech? I own a gun. Is that hate speech? I don't like Eric Adams. Is that hate speech? I think that Kathy Holchel's an idiot. Is that hate speech? Like what decides hate speech? And that's a fireable offense right now in the police department. And then, you know, like all this stuff with the vaccine mandate, I have lawyers, I have media, I have all these people reaching out to me. How come we can't get any other cops? I'm like, because if they talk, they're getting fired. If they talked again, fire, especially yeah. if they're a male white, especially if they're a male white, who's the most marginalized police officer in the NYPD, who would take six times longer for them to get the, the rank of sergeant detective squad, for them to get a lieutenant uh, special assignment, for them to get deputy inspector. And nobody talks about that. And, you, you know, and, and to me, you know, we're a diverse department. And if you just promote the best people, It'll be the most, it'll still be, you'll see true diversity because by, by promoting the, the most competent people, it'll still be a, a rainbow, a myriad of, of all of, of all of our communities. And right now it doesn't look like a myriad of all our communities. It looks like, uh, you know, it looks like it's intentionally violating every OEO law that I could think of by saying, oh, you know what, we're going to promote black and brown people. We're going to promote women. Oh, and you're a male white. Sorry. It's not your and I, and this has been said to a million cops. You're not the flavor of this department anymore, which is disgusting. And, you know, a lot of guys won't come out and ever say that. And, you know, I, maybe in years you'll see a lawsuit, but you haven't seen any yet. But it's it's blatant. They write it in the orders now. They write racism in the orders 
but you can't have a bumper sticker with the Gatson flag that's part of our nation's founding. You know, that's disgusting. It's truly yeah. disgusting. It's right behind me. It's right behind me on yep. the wall. And that was another thing. I didn't remove that from my trunk because I said that flag actually has meaning to me. I can tell you what that flag's about. In 1775, Chris, uh, Christopher Gadsden of, of South Carolina, when he sent the box of snakes over to Britain, I can tell the whole story. This means something to me. And it means, and it, there's no negative. I don't care who adopts the flag, the original meaning of it. It's, an, it's a symbol of patriotism, American patriotism and nationalism. That's what it is. Loving one's own country. And it's a symbol of our freedom. So that people could say, oh, I seen the flag at this event. I don't care where you've seen the flag, but when you see the flag on me, it means, ask me what it means. Cause that, you know, that's what it means. You know, it's not gonna be what you say. It's gonna be what I say. Yeah. Well now, now, you know, we're getting to the point where, oh, if you drive a pickup truck, oh, it's offensive to certain people. You know, I see people taking pictures of themselves next to pickup trucks. What does this guy need a pickup truck for? I used to get, I used to get fucking notes on my pickup truck. What do you need this car for, you piece of shit? I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, 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 you know, like my pickup truck is offensive to you. I use it. it Is it because of the gas or is it because like it's supposed to represent something? I think that, I think that because you have a pickup truck, you're, and and I don't, and I'm another guy. I don't have, I'm a very political person, but I don't have anything on my truck because I don't want to identify myself at all because my kids are in the car. I don't want to identify myself in any way, shape, or form. But just the mere fact I had a pickup truck makes me a white supremacist, a right-wing extremist. All of these things, right? Like, just because I like I like to go to beaches that I can drive on, so I like a pickup truck. I do a lot of side work. I do a lot of work on my house on my own. I need the pickup truck to put things in the back. Like, it just is what it is. Like, I that's the – it's 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 – to me, it's the ultimate family sedan is the is the pickup truck. But you know, it's it's uh it's uh it's crazy where we're going, man. It's fucking nuts. It's fucking yeah. Nuts. Because it, it, soon it'll be if if you want to be on the job, you got to drive an electric Subaru or a Prius and ride a bicycle when you're not going to work. That's going to be the rule. And yeah, you're right. Away with it. You're right. They'll you're right. Away with they it. will. You're right. They will. Remember the kid had. Uh, do you, I don't. Do you remember the kid? He had a. Uh, he had the Dukes of Hazard car. The uh, what's the name of it? The uh, General Lee. The General Lee, and they told him he can't take it to work anymore. They told him he can't take it to work anymore because the the General Lee. It's an iconic vehicle from a TV show, and yeah. even that flag, you know, maybe his his family fought in the South. Why can't he be proud of that? Like, you know what I mean? That's my heritage. It's my roots. It is what it is. It, 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 that's exactly. I had relatives that fought for the Confederacy. They're originally from Pennsylvania. But then they went down south. Uh, another long story, but there's nothing racist about that flag. If you make it racist, that's on you. But the flag itself is not does not represent racism. It, re- it, it represents when the 13 states were seceding from the Union, they made their own flag. That's all it is. It's a heritage flag. And the car has nothing to do with anything. It's a car from, what? What if he was bought a DeLorean? And he, because he's a Back to the Future fan. You gonna bitch about that too? So he bought a Dukes and Hazard car. I, I I think I think you're right though. I think you predicted the future. I think yeah, you, it's gonna be offensive to have a gas car very soon. That's coming. It's gonna be offensive. And they will, and they will get away with it. And yeah. because and I'll tell you, the unions will not fight. The unions oh. will not fight for it. They'll be the first ones with the electric cars. I hate to say. It. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I did this on my own. I don't think that it's right. Same shit that they did with the vaccine. You know, same fucking shit that they backed off of all that. They basically told us we're all a bunch of jerk offs. And now that that we had that big hearing in city council, they're all coming out tweeting about it. Yeah, you know, we we we've been going after city council. You haven't been doing shit. Just stay in your lane. Stay holding the the mayor's water. Stay out of that fight. Stay out of that. You guys had nothing to do with it. You threw a bunch of bullshit lawsuits together. I'm totally against the mandate. I think it's totally illegal. It violates so many laws that I could speak of, so many things that I know. I'm totally, totally against it. If they presented me those lawsuits, I would fucking throw them in the garbage. I would be like, are you kidding me? This, this, isn't, this doesn't even hold water. I don't even know what you're talking about. Didn't even make a legal argument, you know? Um, so, yeah. You know, the unions- the, you know what the union should have did? And I was telling people this, and they were like, oh, Tommy, you're right. But I have no power. I was telling people, here's how it should have went. We'll take a union. For, let's take the SVA as an example, right? Sergeant's Benevolent. There's about 5,000 sergeants in the city. If I was in charge of the union, what I would have said is, if you want to get that vaccine, get it. If you don't, don't. 
But for the people that got it, until every one of our members gets it, do not submit it to the department. So pretty much if you want it, get it, but don't submit the paperwork. We're going to stick together and yeah. no one is submitting paperwork. Yeah. No one is submitting it because it's unlawful. And that's what, that's what we pay dues for. We have law firms, you know, oh, what is it? This SBA has the, the, the Quinn um, firm. Loses. They all have Loses. lawyers. Loses. For what? What do they have these lawyers for? Tommy, they didn't, they didn't do yeah. any of a fight. Tommy, when I, I started, I was pissed about the masking and the testing, right? I had just got over COVID. I had it bad. You know, and of course, COVID's so dangerous, but don't worry that you had pneumonia for nine days. Don't worry they have scarring on your lungs and diminished lung functions. We need you back out of, out of detail for 18 hours. Guy that's never been sick for fucking 18 years. I, I was sick a couple of times. You know what I mean? Never been out. Never playing the game. I've had slip disc in my back. I never fucking played that game to try to go get three quarters or anything else. But I, I after COVID, I was a little fucked up, dude. I was like, I was not walking well. I wasn't breathing well. I was like, and they rushed me back to work. And I'm like, whatever. I, I kind of wanted to get back to work because I don't believe in sitting around and getting fat. I think that'll kill you. You know what I mean? So I, I want to be back in, in the game. You know, I think that's how you got to get, you got how to have it to recover from things. Um, but they basically blow it off like it's nothing. And at the same time, right after that, they're telling me, oh, you got to wear a mask and you got to test and all your guys got a mask and test. And they're sending inspections around to look for masks. And I'm like, no, none of my guys, I'm not telling anybody to wear a mask. I'm not telling one person to wear a mask. Give me a fucking CD. I don't give a fuck. A CD is a command discipline. But, I, you know, I bring that up at the union. I'm like, this is illegal, man. This is creating a two-tier society. You're, uh, you're, you're segregating people. Like, this is crazy. How are we doing this? Like, what, what, like how could you, you know, we, you, we, it should be a fight for it. Lou Turco turns around and says, uh, we're not doing anything about it. Nothing's going on. Nobody's getting disciplined over it. If somebody gets disciplined, call me. He goes, but I got news for you. That vaccine mandate's coming down. And this is in July before Adams even signs in, before he even wins the election, right? And they're like, he's like, I got news for you. That, that thing's coming down. There's nothing we're going to do about it. It's bigger than us. It's bigger than the LBA. It's bigger than the NYPD. It's bigger than New York City. And this, this, he are, had already made the decision without even knowing how many members of hit of the LBA were even affected, that they weren't going to do anything about it. That's how weak our unions are. It, it's disgusting. I don't want to ramble on that, that thing. I want to, I want to talk about you. I don't want to talk about the mandate, but that, that just, it's just a, uh, it's just a microcosm of how weak they are. Right. Like they, they, they are in, they are in the game for themselves. They're not representing their membership. Uh, clear as day with the, with the FDNY uh, endorsement of Kathy Hochul. 99% of their members are going to vote for Lee Zeldin. Um, and, you know, and, and yet Kathy Holchel gets their union dues and gets their banner on, on her campaign. It's, it's a disgrace. Ansbro, if you're listening, you're a loser. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, sorry. So, uh, so yeah, so you get in trouble for that. So you get some bullshit for that. You got to deal with that, that you have a Gatson flag and you have a fuck you and you got to really do this, this thing. Um, what else? Like anything else? Like how, wh when did you start really thinking, like, I, I think I'm going to leave? I want to say in the, in, in, in the neighborhood of maybe like 2017, 2018, you started seeing these changes, how <clears throat> it was getting to the point where you just can't live. And the scrutiny that you're living under, it's uncomfortable, it's unhealthy. And it's, again, it's, it just, it violates every one of my, I don't have the rights that other people have but I'm supposed to be working to protect the rights of others and doing the job for you, working for the people. But everything I do is bad and trouble. Everything I say, everywhere I go, you know? I mean, they just have such a hold on your life. They own you. The police department, when you work for them, they own you. And it, no one will back you up. They will tell you what you're gonna do, what you're gonna wear, what you're not gonna do, who you're gonna hang out with, what you put in your body, Look, when they, they, they legalized marijuana for recreational use, and the first thing the police department did, you still can't use it, right? Boom, the next day, you still can't use it. They didn't put a panel together. It wasn't discussed. They didn't put the pros and cons together, but I could still go and I, I, I can go buy a fifth of gin right now and drink it and go putz it around the neighborhood, right? I mean, that's still okay, but I, but you know, we, we can't, you know, 
legislation passed that marijuana was legal. Legislation passed. That's it. It's legal. It's in the realm now of tobacco and alcohol and caffeine, coffee. I mean, yeah. it's, it's all the same thing. It's, it's a drug. It's a mind or body altering substance. Oh, I thought I lost you for a second. No, no, no. I got you. And what bothered me was it wasn't even a question, a discussion. It was the next day, boom, the gavel gets hit. And no, the answer is no, you can't do it. Can't do it. That's it. Yeah. And, and, and they that- own you where you live. You know what? Why, why can't I live in, in Woodbridge, New Jersey? Why? Why? I'll pay my taxes. Why can't I live there? There's no reason for it. It's one of their rules and regulations that violates everything else about your life. Everything. No, yeah, it's it's uh it's uh you know it's definitely remember the clubs. Remember the club shirts. Remember the fun the club shirt. Oh they, yeah, yeah. They even cracked down on the club shirts. I mean, it's innocent. It's stupid. They they raise money for the club to to pay for the Christmas parties and to send flowers to people who have relatives that died, and the club shirts had to get. Oh, it's got to be approved through internal affairs. Approved. It's a shirt. It's a shirt with a yeah. picture on it. Probably something humorous that maybe we find funny, but I mean they're telling you what to wear. Yeah, no, and even 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 the remember trans- the muscle milk. Remember the muscle milk. I I I think the rant about this, but remember for a while you couldn't drink the muscle milk because yep. it gave a, a false positive when you took a drug test. It's a yep. fucking protein drink you buy in the bodega. Yep. It's a protein drink. It's made of milk. Yeah, they told us that anything that we took had to be NSF certified. So we couldn't even take protein because they're like, oh, you could you could possibly pop positive. And we and they did. They 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 did a couple of dudes did pop positive for taking protein powder. And they fucking shelved them for like a year and almost put them through hell and almost fired them. But and and to me it was like that was like, you know why? Because you don't want any of us to work out. You don't want any. And then the same thing with the tattoos. You don't want any of us to have twos, tattoos. You don't want any of us to look intimidating anymore. You want us to look like we're little, like, I don't know what, what, like, I, but, and, and that's not how police work is. That's not how this city Sounds is. to me like North Korea. It doesn't sound like my America. Yeah. It doesn't sound like my America where they got, they are going to give you an order on everything you can do in your life. Yeah. You know? Everything you can do. Uh, there's going to be more. I'm, I'm writing a book about all of this. Good. A really nice book about it. It's a tell-all book. Good. There's going to be, John, there will be no holding back in this book. No, and there's, I, a, there's, there's, there's a fictional character that I have in the book. <clears throat> you know what his name is? Joe Jerkoff. Yep. Joe Jerkoff. And Joe Jerkoff and Jane Jerkoff represent just your average citizens. And what I do is I differentiate the differences of both, of what happens when Joe Jerkoff does this, opposed to what happens to us, whether it's illegally parking or having a dispute with their spouse or eating a poppy seed bagel. It could be anything. Yep. And I go through all the things that citizens could do and all the things we are threatened with. Absolutely. And it's all threats of discipline. Yeah, no, all it's, threats of discipline. It's, it's nuts. It's, it's cre- everything, right? You'll, you'll be armed at all times. You'll never be unfit for duty unless you're uh, unless you're out sick and convalescing, right? So yeah. Basically, I tell you, you could never drink. You could never drink. And and for those of you that don't know, that that always accuse cops of going out and getting drunk and getting into fights, we're the last people that want to get into a fight with you in New York City. You could literally come over and sucker punch me and fucking if I have a beer. I'm going to be fucking modified. I'm going to be suspended. I'm going to be sent to the farm. All because you sucker punched me. I didn't even do anything. You just didn't like me. You don't like ball guys, whatever it is, you know, and, and even that, like, it, it's like, it's a demasculation. It really is. It's, it's fucking, it's, tell us, tell us what your, what your, your mug says for the, for the people that, that, uh, that don't see you on. The oh thing. yeah. This was a gift. This says goodbye tension. Hello pension. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, but as you know, and that's that's a telltale, right? Like you're dealing with this tension, and and it's crazy because I've been retired now six months. I still feel tension. It's fucking nuts, man. I thought it would go away, but it hasn't. Um, I still feel like that oversight pressure. <laughs> I don't know why. You know, it's, My, it's mine. Mine is it's, it's flowing out. I'm I'm loosening up a lot more. Not that I ever was the kind of guy to hold back, which was the reason I was always in trouble. That's yeah, another yeah. thing. A guy like me, I was always in trouble. I never committed a crime. I never got arrested. 
I was always in trouble just for living my life. Yep. For, you know, and then, and, but now I'm getting used to just opening up more and just being me, you yeah. know? And I'm not, I have no, I have no bad intentions, but I want to be me. Maybe I'm a little loud and obnoxious, but that's just me. That's not going to change. But when you work for the police department, you can't do that. You can't okay. be loud and obnoxious. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No. So, so, all right. So you retire, right? You make this post online. Right. And, and your post, yeah, you're wearing a let's go Brandon shirt. You gave a finger to a, a bunch of different photos. You give fingers, you give a finger to a statue and you literally say on the post, you say, I never posted work pitches. A chunk of you all probably don't even know I worked in the NYPD, but I'm officially retired today from this sorry excuse for a shit job. Thank God I'm free at last. Not my problem anymore. I loved everyone I work with and some of the people I worked for, but this job is no one's friend. It's time to live free. See you all out there. You know, I, I'm listening to that statement, dude. You just thanked everybody you worked with. You just told everybody you love them. You just told me you love the NYPD. You told me you had some bad bosses that you, you know, you won't thank. And you're just relieved of all of it. And, and, and to me, I took the middle fingers as an F you to the mayor, to the regime, to the nonsense, you know, could you just unpack that for us? Like what, what, what that was? Yes. Well, just to, just, I had, just want to plug my phone just yeah. to clear it up out there for anybody who is ignorant to actually think that I had any bad intentions with that statue. I didn't know what that statue meant. I didn't know. And you know what, to be honest, most people, like people I talked to, they didn't really know what the true meaning behind that statue was. I didn't obviously, know it either. I didn't know it either. John, I, obviously, not that I have to explain this bullshit, but yeah. obviously I'm not giving the finger to a memorial wall. I yeah. mean, I was giving the finger to something I thought just represented the NYPD because I see it in headquarters and Yep. People give them away at the uh, like retirement parties. They buy the statues. To me, it's another, yeah. it's another idiosyncratic. Uh, it's a statue. I didn't know the, the meaning behind it. You know what? Fine, shame on me. But there was no ill intent with that. Other than that, giving the finger, I have no regrets in that. I have no regrets in giving the finger. And 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 that statement I made was from the heart. That statement I made was from the heart. I mean, every word yeah. of it. Yeah, I I, I I don't think you said anything bad, but you know, online it was like I was defending you that whole day. I'm getting all this. What about the families that died in 9/11? I'm like, this guy, this guy was a cop for 20 years. He was an actual real cop. You know, he wasn't just a guy that got a statue at the end of his retirement with four arrests and fucking roto lady summonses. I'm like, this dude was out there locking up bad guys, getting guns off the street. He loves the job. He loves the city. He loves the people he works with. He mentored tons of people he took mentorism from the other guys and and you know and it, it's it was insane to me to to like the way i seen that go you know whoever whoever sent that video to the news you're a jerk off you're a no rat. no what happened I'll, t- I'll tell you what happened with that it wasn't somebody who was retired obviously took it the wrong way and blew it up on social media media demonizing me now the person that started it because it it grew legs obviously and it got big the person who started it reached out to me we spoke he was apologetic because we spoke and people were telling him like yo this guy he's not a bad guy and everything so that got cleared up but the post was doing a story about that mass exodus they call it everybody leaving and and hire so they were doing that they got wind of the story of the facebook post so they found my not my phone number on facebook and they and the girl reached out to me and she goes we're going to do a story on you. Uh, if you want to make a couple statements, you can. But either way, we're going to do a story. But it's, but it's a nice story. It's not like a, a bad story. Like, you know, we're on your side. Like, there's a mass exodus. Everyone's leaving. The retirement's through the roof, and they can't hire. So I go, okay. So that was a story of how that made the media with all the pictures and everything. They got the pictures from Facebook. Um, but I got more fans from it than anything. But it started out, like I said, it was some older, retired uh, cop. And... He took offense to it because he thought I was giving the finger to the memorial wall. And it was like a temper tantrum, but we cleared it up, me and him. Me and him cleared yeah. it up. If he's out there listening, it's good. We're still going to get that cigar one day. You know, we're, we're, we're talking. He's I just like it. me and I'm just like him. So 
But you know what? I'm glad that they interviewed me because I said I, I, I made it brief. It was short and sweet to the point. But everything on there, this is why they can't hire anybody. And this is why everyone's leaving. Yeah. It's the sad truth. But this is, this is it. This is why I'm leaving. And this is why I gave the finger. This is why I gave the finger because this is what I'm driven to. I didn't want to be driven to this. I wanted to leave gracefully. But they didn't. They didn't build it for me to be great. Even on my last day, there was, I took my kids to headquarters on that day, the one where I gave the finger. Yeah. Even that was an aggravating day. Yep. What I had to go through that day, i tell you something. It took eight hours for me to retire. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The, the day I got hired was a problem. The day I left was a problem. And my kids got, even my kids, my kids, my kids are young. And even my, my son, my son's 11 years old. He goes, hey, dad, why is it such a problem? <laughs> why is it such a problem? I went to hand in my phone and the, they, they looked, the, uh, the SIM card didn't match the IMEI. It's the phone they gave me. Oh, we got to wait. Wait for what? I gave you the phone. Yeah, yeah. What do you want me to do? Yeah, yeah. What do you want? Send me a bill if it's anything. Like, like they leave thought, me alone. They, they, they thought that I did something to my shield. They thought I painted it. You had to be there because it, it, it's, it, it's too much. To, I tell you, eight hours I was there. All I wanted to do was retire and take my kids to Wohop and get some ribs. That's all I wanted. Yeah. No, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, I mean, retiring for me was awful too. I mean, uh, you know, I, I was like, for me, I left, I vested, I vested 18 years. The director was like holding me up. He wouldn't give me my numbers. He wouldn't do anything. And I was like, I can't believe this is how you're treating people on the way out. And the guy's like, what are you leaving for? You leaving because of the shot? I was like, no, I'm just leaving. I don't want to, I don't want to work for people like you anymore. And I just going to go move to Florida and live my life. I was like, he's like, it's because of the shot. Right. I was like, it's because of nothing. It's because I want to retire. I'm like, do you, do you talk to criminals in the street like this? No, you don't, because you're a civilian. Don't talk to me. I served 18 years for the city. Uh, you know, oh, you threatening me, held me up. I couldn't retire till the next day I finally got my numbers after I had to get tons of people involved to retire. I'm like, this is disgusting. Even I was like, I was like, it was like, it was, it was a fucking, it was almost like, I was like, holy shit. I was like, this is just cementing my decision to leap. Because this is what you think of us. We're pieces of shit. You treat us like that on the way out. So, no, I'm glad you spoke on that, dude. But I knew the minute I saw that photo that you were saying it was a, it was a F you to the job. It was a, not to the people into the job, to the, the appointed leadership that's ran this job for the 10 years. They ran this job to the ground. They ran this city to the ground because they're cowardly and they won't tell the truth. And that is, to me, I'll never forgive that, dude. Like, listen, if you were the police commissioner right now, you're 41 years old, you got a family, I'm 42, I got a family. If I, if I watched you bend, I could understand it. These guys are 60 years old with $25,000 a month pensions. And they will not break rank even in retirement. You have a real Bratton. All these guys, Dermot Shea, who was the biggest coward of them all, the first police commissioner ever that supported defund the police, supported firing cops, good cops, biggest coward I ever met, um, to totally demonized his career. And, you know, it's 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 all all for the almighty dollar, right? They're, they're sitting there saying Eric Adams is doing all he can do. He just got into office. He's doing a great job. The guy's awful. The guy is awful. They ran this to the. They ran this job into the ground. Yeah, he's I, highly incompetent and racist. Highly incompetent and racist. Yeah, and he is racist, right? The cracker statement. Every day I was kicking those crackers' asses, and it was. It, and and they spun it. They spun it to be. Oh, it was about his work. The guy had eleven career arrests. I was a cop <laughs> the same time as him. I had 145 to my name. I, I probably was involved in about close to 1,000 at that point. You probably had a lot more than that. I think you were a little bit more active than me. You were in Brooklyn. You, you, I'm sure you had hundreds of arrests too in the same time frame. Very, we were only cops for a few years before we, we became sergeants. Um, and the guy had an awful career. His evaluations were awful. He was almost fired from this job twice. And, you know, oh, I was kicking crack his asses. How? Like, how, what would you show in anybody? What were you showing anybody? You didn't do the job. You weren't a proactive police officer. And he's obviously not a proactive mayor. He's a proactive in the nightlife. He's proactive to go hanging out with all the guys. But that's all he's proactive. He, he wears those stupid jackets about the guns, uh, gun free. Look at this gun free zone nonsense now. Come on. I mean, th th this is what he, uh, he, for a while, he was doing the vegan school meals. Yep. This is what he's doing. He, the, the city is, is turning to ashes. It looks like it's a militarized zone. 
you know, and he's worried about vegan meals in schools for kids. Yeah, yeah. What about that? What about the gun-free zones in Times Square? Look, I got, I got the thing behind me. Times Square, baby. What uh, what uh, what do you think about it? Is it the, do you believe that there's going to be any impact in 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 re- deterring shootings or crime in the Times Square area? Absolutely not. You know why? The gun-free laws, the gun-free zone laws, apply to people who have licenses for guns. It doesn't apply to people who illegally carry guns. It doesn't apply to them at all. They're still going to illegally carry. They're still going to get away with illegally carrying it. And they're still going to get away for shooting the guns. Whether it's reckless endangerment or felony assault or murder, they're going to get light sentences. If, God forbid, me and you get caught up there with a gun, uh, we get the gun taken from us, probably get arrested, probably be fines, embarrassment, name in the paper. Yep. We're legal gun. We're legal. The Supreme Court overruled that decision because it violated constitutional rights. That's supposed to mean something when the Supreme Court makes a decision. Not that who did this? The governor with that gun free zone? It was the was governor. It? Yeah, it was the governor. All right. Not so she could override the Supreme Court, make up her own laws of where we can and can't carry legal firearms. If you want it, to make a constitutional amendment, it's going to take 38 states, their governor, there's a, there's a whole process behind it, and it'll never happen. So the perps can have guns, and they could use guns, but we have to worry about where we take our legal guns, our licensed firearms yeah. that we use for our protection. But if you're a gang member, go to Times Square, do whatever you want. You should see, I work right near Times Square. Everyone is either smoking weed or selling it, Vagrants, skids, bums, uh, beggars, junkies, encampments, dope heads, zombies. I mean, it's it's deplorable. Nah, it's know. awful. What it looks like. Nah, nah, it's awful. Yeah, no, nah, it's awful, man. It's it's awful. I he posted today, Eric Adams. He posted on Twitter. He said, uh, "What did he say?" He said, "The First Amendment overrides the Second Amendment." Right. The First Amendment overrides the Second Amendment, and it's it's our job to go after gun lobbyists and gun manufacturers. And, you know, I believe that I believe in the power of the First Amendment. I believe that the First Amendment was written for a reason, because if you control my speech, you control my thought, you control the ability to think around things and create words and create legislation and do all that. But the First Amendment only exists because of the Second Amendment. And that is that is how we were formed. Um, I had a great conversation yesterday with Joe Pinion. I won't talk about it on the record uh, on the record because it, it's it, it was a private conversation. But uh, if anybody's listening to this, make sure you vote for Joe Pinion, U.S. Senate. The guy is unbelievable. He said to me, "The Second Amendment wasn't made for shooting pheasants." Let's be honest about it. The Second Amendment was not made for shooting pheasants. It's a hard heavy conversation but it wasn't for that it wasn't for duck hunting you know and uh so it, it's it, it's it's and, and you're right you're right it's it's targeted enforcement right it's like no we're letting all these criminals walk out 90 percent of gun crimes in this city go uncharged never even mind that they get to court and they get light sentences they go uncharged nothing happens to them the case gets dropped it's it's a travesty but is my case going to get dropped if i walked into that gun free zone by accident legal gun carrier owner um i won't say i never committed a crime because i've been arrested twice but but <laughs> but be, let's say that i wasn't let's say that i wasn't um i was a cop for 20 years and i was never arrested and i uh and that guy's going to get charged to the fullest extent of the law like you said he's going to be front page of the paper Hopefully he doesn't have a Trump. Uh, hopefully he doesn't vote for Donald Trump. But he's not a Republican. Hopefully he's not white. You know. Yeah. Um, but did you see the other thing on that list of the gun-free zones, houses of worship? What happened to the separation of church and state? That's not government property. That's not state property either. You're yeah. gonna tell me I can't bring my gun into church? My pastor likes that I have my firearm in church. He feels safe when I'm in church. Tommy, I'll but tell the you. The city is gonna say I can't. They don't run that house of worship. I mean, I'll tell you, the last 10 years, I felt that we were so open and we were doing so little for Roman Catholics. Um, I, I couldn't even sit in mass. I would stand out. I would stand at the door and listen with my gun on me. 
in case somebody came in, you know, we, we you know, just because from everything that's going on in the world, we're being persecuted all over the world. And it's, you know, I, 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 I don't have that going on me to do anything but pr- protect innocent life. That is it. And you're going to tell me that I can't, that that's a, that's a vulnerable target. Schools are a vulnerable target. Hospitals are a vulnerable target. Why will we not have guns there? Why, why is it okay for criminals to run around the streets with guns and they'll be in those zones. We just won't be, you won't get those guys that are there to protect innocent life. So it's, it's, it's a travesty, man. It really is. Um, you know, so what do you see for the future? Like, what do you see like the way forward? Like, we don't want, I don't, we don't got to get into like what, what you're doing now. That's your own personal stuff. But like, what do you see for the future? Like, what, what, what do you think? You know, we got kids. I, I think about it every day, you know, like I, I'm, I'm worried about yes, like, my, like, like what, what do I see for myself or what do I see like in general? What do you see in general for New York? Like for the police department? Like, how do we write the ship? Like, I, it, it, if, if it ever gets better, <clears throat> it's going to get worse before it gets better. They can't hire. <clears throat> what they're hiring is substandard. I mean, there are no standards. It used to be in New York's finest. There was a standard. Now it's New York's whoever will take whoever will take the job. They took equal employment opportunity to a dangerous level. And the incompetency, the uh, illiterance, I mean, it's just all, you know, what they're molding them into, of uh, governing them with fear. It's gonna to get to the point where the lawlessness is gonna get worse than it is now. And the people are actually gonna to have to vote these Democrats out of office so a new regime can come in and start where Bloomberg, even like with Giuliani, where Giuliani had the city going after the quality of life enforcement. Remember, he went after like the fireworks, the graffiti. He went after the gangs. He went after the mafia. The quality of life, the squeegee men. Remember the squeegee men? Yep. You start small, you work your way up. But the main thing with all of this, you're giving the instructions to these cops, is you have to assure these cops that they will be protected when people complain about them. Because people will complain. They gave CCRB way too much power. They gave the, the, the public way too much power and the media way too much power. I mean, the police commissioner is supposed to be running the show. The police Absolutely. commissioner is appointed to oversee the department of 32,000 or, uh, or however many there are in the police department, but they don't, they're pawns. Somebody needs to take charge. And when the media or the public or CCRB says, we're gonna go after this cop for doing this, it's the commissioner's job to say, no, we're not. Absolutely. I promise I would protect that officer when they did their job properly. And that's what I'm going to do. And we're going to stand behind them. We're not going to criminally prosecute. We're not going to fire. We're not going to, not, it's not going to be a circus. Like I said, let's go back to an old story. A guy like Hugh Barry. That, that should have been a newspaper article and ended there. Ended there. That's okay. it. We have units within the department that investigate police shootings. We have the FID. Yep. It ends there. FID handles it. And if anyone asks FID, maybe we'll release some information. Maybe we won't, but we got it. And that's how it's going to be. And, and FID investigated that shooting and said it was a good shooting. And then it got reopened. That's another fact that we left out. They investigated that shooting and they said it was a good shooting. It, it, but oh, politically, no, 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 no. De Blasio doesn't want that. And you got these guys that, you know, and again, I'll say it like they're 30 year cops. They were, they demonized us. We were the best generation of cops that there ever was on this job. We actually did do community policing. We did deter crime. They were awful. They, they were shoving plunges up people's asses. They were stealing. They were smacking kids over the head with nightsticks who were mounting off in the park and leaving them there bleeding. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it in Bensonhurst with my own eyes. Cops smack a kid over the head, you know, and, and, and walk out the door. And now these guys are in charge of the department. And I know a lot of them had great careers as cops and sergeants and lieutenants and captains, but they sold their soul out. They sold everything that we're talking about. They still say at their their family table they still talk about with their family friends but when they get on the news it's totally different and and even with the go to go back to the danny panaleo again he got fired because eric gardner fell on his arm for four seconds that's what james o'neill deemed as that was the fireable offense four seconds when eric gardner fell on top of his arm four seconds that's why he died one two three four in the middle of a fight for your life. 
in the middle of a fight with a giant. Um, and it, it was disgusting. And he said he has it over. He has a, uh, he has a responsibility to, to keep the city safe. So he has to, he has to fire him. And to me, that was, again, that was letting the mob rule. That was a mob rule decision. That wasn't the decision of uh, on the side of anything. That wasn't on the decision on the side of justice. It wasn't. It, it wasn't on the side of truth. It was. It was awful. Um, yeah, it really is a shame. It was. It, it was even a shame of how long he was on ice. How long they had to tuck him away, and he was modified. And you know, he gets. He he gets. Um, you know, the the grand jury. Dan Donovan did an amazing job um, with that grand jury. He got cleared in the grand jury. Then the big one was the um, the civil rights violations case. Yep. He gets cleared on that. And then he gets cleared on federal charges. How many more, you know, legal realms does he have to get cleared on? But of course, you know, he couldn't, you know, God, you know they, they had to fire him anyway. He won all of the battles yep. and they still had to terminate him and publicly terminate him and make, make him look like a bad guy and pretty much give a win to the ignorant public that wants that wants to see that yep. you know no yeah it was a uh, yeah no it was it was terrible man it was it was absolutely yeah. terrible but you know he would listen he was a puppet to the Blasio who was a disgrace so listen i knew that was going to go bad when the grand jury didn't want to indict pantaleo do you remember that very sad news conference that the Blasio did he looked like he was going to cry he was he, he was, was crying yeah he was completely against it. He goes, ah, you know, he should have, he should have been, a, he should have been a man and a mayor, and said, listen, this is our judicial system. The wheels of justice turned. Some of you are going to like the decision. Some of you are not going to like it. But I'll tell you one thing: there will be no chaos and disorder. You can protest that you're right, but there will be no chaos and disorder. This is, and we're going to move forward. He should have said something to that effect, but yep. instead he completely pandered to the public. And he looked like he was personally hurt by the, the whole, I can't believe that he didn't get charged with a crime. That's your guy. He worked, th that was the Blasio's guy. The police yeah. department works for him. This is the twilight zone, John, that, that this goes on. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's crazy, man. That, that was a, 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 it was a terrible time. And he gets cleared under Obama administration federally. It's not even like you could say, like, oh, it's political. No, this you had your people were in charge of everything, man. You had, yeah. you, you know, Obama was, you know, to me, Obama started all the tension with the police. You know, before that, yeah. like, I think we were riding high after September 11th. You know, that whole incident that happened at, at, with the Harvard professor or wherever he worked, that was the start of all of it. You know, that was the start of the anti-police sediment. Then we had the Michael Brown incident followed by the Garner, and we were just getting crushed, man. All this. Hey, who was the 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 kid, the kid with the hoodie? Was that um, with Zimmerman? Who was that? Was that Brown? No, that was Trayvon Martin. Tra that was the one. Remember Obama? That ignorant statement that he made when he yep. gets up there on national TV and he says, "This kid could have been my son." Yeah. Right there, right there, you fucked the whole thing up. You're the leader. You you're, you're the lead. You're you're the world leader here. I mean, and this is you make an ignorant, stupid statement like that. You might as well just get on and tell people just start hating the police because they are going to, you know, this is what they do. Yeah, no, that, that's that was the start. The facts of the case weren't even out yet. He goes up there like an idiot and goes, "Oh, this kid could have been my son." Yeah. Well, if that could have been your son, then you're doing a then you're doing a shitty job of parenting, is what I would have told him. Yeah. If that could have been your son, you did a shitty job of parenting. Yeah, and, and then uh, De Blasio tries to make that same statement years later with his son, with his big stupid afro, saying that he, it could be his son. I'm like, no cop is stopping your son. Your son looks harmless. If I, and, I, and I've said it before. If somebody came over to me and was like, yo, that kid robbed me, I'd be like, yo, go, I'll, I'm going to take you to a boxing class, learn how to fight, because there's no way that kid robbed you. There's no way cops are out there targeting Bill de Blasio's son with his dumb afro. Um, I mean, they, at this point, we're probably targeting his daughter, who by all means is, I mean, even though drugs are legal now. So if drugs were illegal. Yeah, it's a drug, drug addict EDP that she is. Yeah, yeah. You, you know? know, so it's uh, it's nuts. So listen, I don't want to keep you all night, but, uh, you know, I like to always give like, you know, the last word, like your message, your kids, the world, whatever you want to talk about, you know, whatever, whatever. 
this, I mean, I'm hoping maybe one day we do this again, a podcast. Uh, oh, absolutely. Different. This one, it seemed to be based around the incident with me and police work. So what I'm going to say out there is, is that if you have any inclination to be a cop, what I would suggest to anyone out there who would think about this or family members thinking about this is before you do it, demand change because you are going into a gauntlet. You are going into the seventh circle of hell and until things change, it will not get better. So before you sign that contract, before you sign 25 or more years of your life away, demand change because things were a lot better. I mean, things were great. I loved this stuff for years. I lasted longer than most. I mean, I was, you, you remember me. I, I was there to do it and I loved it. And I had nothing bad to say about anybody or anything about the police department until it went, it went down the tubes. So if you're thinking of taking this job or getting into this line of work, there are things that need to be changed and it needs to go start from the top down. Start from the justice department. There needs to be less scrutiny and there needs to be just more freedom given to police do their job, whether it's public service or law enforcement. And until then, it will not get better. It's just scientifically impossible. It will not get better. The results are out there. Go, don't even read the paper, just go out into the world. We live in New York City, go into New York City and you see it firsthand. This is what you, you got. This is what you have now. This is the result of lawlessness, lawlessness, lawlessness. Without the police, this is what you have. So that's my message. Uh, let's see, I mean, do you have any questions or anything? Or yeah, I mean, uh, so there's a question I I always ask everybody that I, that I didn't ask you. Um, would you come on again? At the time you came on, would you do it over again? <laughs> at the time I came on, absolutely. At- me too. Absolutely. Now I'm going to ask you, would you come on right now? No, absolutely not. Unless I get offered a job, a civilian position to, uh, to rewrite the book, to rewrite the book. We have to turn the clocks back and rewrite the book. Uh, there's a lot of rules and regulations that are outdated and there's a lot of rules and regulations that are just unconstitutional. And we need to give back the freedoms and give back the rights to the cops to do their job and uh, to not worry, to live in fear. That would be what I would take now, you know, not for any kind of just just to, you know, just just to salvage what's left of it, because it's heading to a point where it's going to have to be completely restructured from the bottom up. It's going to have to be restructured because it's getting to the point where it's impossible. Yeah. And when policing, policing is impossible and the city is in shambles, you have to start over. You have to wipe the slate clean and start from scratch. This is what Giuliani did. He started from scratch and he built it up. And from what we've seen through the Bloomberg and Kelly era was it was great. And then it just went to absolute shit. And the city went to shit, and now it's irreparable. So right now, it needs to be broken and just rebuilt. Yeah, I, I, again, like I said, I think that we were the best generation of cops. I really do. I think in those eras, the Giuliani through the Bloomberg era, that was the best police. That was the best version of the NYPD that we've ever seen. Even though we got the most demonization, we actually did help people. We actually did go out there and serve our community to the fullest. And we were involved in so many other things other than just law enforcement, too. But we were a law enforcement proactive police department. Um, But I think uh, what I keep saying is that if we're headed in this direction, we're going to head to a systemically corrupt organization again. We're getting to the point where cops are afraid in the street. If cops are afraid in the street, cops are going to be afraid in their home. And when we start getting to the point where cops are truly afraid to, because we police our own neighborhoods, you know, I was a neighborhood kid and then I police my own neighborhood. If 
if you are worried about the system not having your back and the just them not having your back, what are you going to do when there's a violent gang telling you you're going to do this or we're going to kill you, we're going to kill your wife, we're going to kill your kids? Guess what you're going to do? You're going to do whatever they tell you because you're going to know that there's no justice system to protect you or your family. So you're it's going to it's going to create a systemically corrupt apartment again. We're already seeing it. Um, you're going to see a lot of it. I mean, there's a lot of corruption politically. Um, it's going to get exposed in the years to come if we do right the ship but i agree with you i'm i'm you know I'm, i like to call myself politically fluid i started off as a democrat then i was a republican i went independent during uh, uh all the mandate shit because i really thought all the guys in the sop as uh, staten island gop and i said it publicly and i'll say it again i think you're all a bunch of cowards uh if i was there right now i would vote for you you know but i wouldn't I, I not because I like you, I, you know, if I was there right now, I'd probably be running against you, honestly, um, because I think, you know, I think that they, they say the right thing, but they just don't do the right thing. They don't do their job. Um, and I mean, guys and girls, you know, um, so, you know, but I do think that the only way forward at this point is you elect common sense people that put this community first that put the tax paying water buying citizens over criminals over feelings like i think that's the only way we're really gonna write right the ship is uh, and and at this point i like i said i'm not a, i'm not a party line guy i you know i'm friends with a couple of democrats i got a uh, brian robinson coming on here probably next week he's a democrat he was running against uh de Blasio in uh, the Congressional District 10. These are common sense people. Bob Holden in Queens, he's a Democrat. I vote for that guy every day of the week. He supports the police. But right now, in this climate, in this moment in time, one party rule has to end in New York City. The only way to do that is vote red down the line. And, and you never vote for a progressive. I don't care. If you have a ballot of all wackos on a, on a ballot, get out there and run. Get out there and run. If you guys need help, you want to do it? Call me. I'll 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 put you in contact with people because that's the, it, it's these progressives have destroyed our city, destroyed it. It's it's awful. John, if we if we do this again, make a notation. If we do this again, we're gonna spend a good hour bashing. I got a lot to tell you about that Justin Brandon. I know him. He's evil. He's garbage. He's a terrible leader. We'll go after him. Believe me, I'll be in the streets going after him. Well, I got uh, I, I got Michael Ragusa coming on. Uh, he's coming on too. He's going to be running against Brandon, and uh, the Brandon's election's not far out. But he already announced his run because he's trying to build money to go against him. So yeah, I, after that one, I'd love to have you back on when you're done with your book. Come back on again. Anything popping off? You want to talk about anything? Always welcome. I mean, this is what this to me. This podcast is. I, I like to give everybody a voice, but truly, honestly, for me, this is my therapy session. It really gets a lot of the shit that's built up inside of me. You, you know, it, like it really does. It gets it out for me. And I, I, I just, you know, I, I hate that I walked away from the job so young because I, I always thought I was going to do 30, 30 years. Um, uh, I thought I was going to retire an old man. I did. And, and I know you did, too. Yeah, I, I thought I was going to be one of those older guys, like in his late 50s, that is still doing it, like still out there. Yeah. Still, you know, out there, you know, going after the bad guys and cleaning it up and, you know, cleaning up street corners, you know, getting out of the car and telling the kids to get off the street. I thought I was going to be that guy. And not, not according to the city of New York. They don't want me. They don't want you. That's it. Yeah. They don't want me and they don't want you. Tommy, where can we find you, my friend? Like where anybody listening? Where would uh, you on social media? Like where, where, where? I have a Facebook account. Yeah, well, everyone knows that I got a you know, the Facebook <laughs> account. <laughs> yeah, the Facebook account is on there. I mean, you know, it's uh, I, I, I never run under aliases. I'm Tommy Gambadella, Tommy, you know, Thomas Gambadella from Staten Island. Uh I'm easy to reach. Like I said, um I don't I don't hide anything. I live in Staten Island, I'm here, my you know, my number is on the on my Facebook page. I'm me. You know me, John. I'm me. I don't Absolutely. run from anything. No, absolutely. That's why I called you. Once that happened, I said, whenever you want to come on, you're ready to talk about it. Let's talk about it. We'll put it out there because it's bullshit. You know, I was like, I, kn I know you love this job. I know you love the city. I know you're a good cop. You know, I thank you for your service to the city. I thank you for mentoring guys like me. I thank you for looking out for guys like me. I thank you for looking out for the city, for for to, for my kids and my wife and 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 everyone in the city. You know, like we need people like you in the city. Yeah, you're no, out. It's just lack of passion. That's a dominant male genio. You need passion in life. 
whether it's for one thing or for 10 things or for everything, you need passion. You can't always be on the sidelines. You can't be quiet. You have to care about things. You got to care about a lot. You got to care about your family. You have to care about your health. You have to care about where you live. You have to care about issues. I mean, you can't just live a life of uh, pop culture and nonsense because it's you're wasting. You have to be passionate and you have to be, sometimes you have to be loud. Sometimes you have to do things. Sometimes you have to do things, even if you know it's going to be a headache later on, because why should you have regrets? I don't have regrets. I don't have regrets. So I do it. And like I said, I don't commit crimes. I'm not a hateful guy, but I'm passionate about a lot of things. And I voice it. I'm not ashamed of it. People talk to me. I tell them. I tell it like it is. Yeah. I'll discuss anything with anybody. I'll break bread with anybody. But we're going to discuss things. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna go, we're going to go back and forth. And that's just how it's going to be. I don't pander. I don't kiss ass. This is me. No, and that's and dude, that's great. I applaud you. That's that's exactly how I am. I I think that it, I think that that's how we all should be. I don't I don't care what faith you are. I don't care who you sleep with at night. I don't give a shit what color your skin is. I don't care who you vote for. Now I do because I think you're an idiot, and and we we'll, we could talk about that. But it seems like today, guys like me and you, nobody wants to talk to us. They don't want to have real conversations. We want to hide from it on their feelings and all that stuff. Oh, and and yeah. I don't believe in that. And that's why we're getting led astray, not only from the police leadership, but from elected. When you have a guy that's a public servant who won't speak to the people he serves, it's, it's disturbing to me, man. It really is. It just shows the lack of care for the community and everything. And I've seen a couple of videos with Adams, the way he talks to people. And I'm like, could you imagine if a cop spoke to somebody like that or a fireman or a sanitation yeah. worker? They'd be fired. I'm like, and this guy's sitting here with his with his suits that we're all paying for, getting driven around with security that we're all paying for, eating steak dinners while he's claiming to be a vegan. And, you know, it, it's like it, all on our dime. And the guy's not working for us, you know. Yeah. So listen, I applaud you, my brother. I, I God bless you and everything you do. You're welcome on the show anytime. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the great and powerful Thomas Gambadella. Thank you for coming on, my brother. John, thank you. Thank you. Stay on Good me. Night. Stay on me. Stay on me. One sec. I'm going to stop okay. the recording.